Our keynote speaker is an award-winning journalist, a writer, a thinker. She's even the owner of an OBE, which is one of the UK's highest honors. She writes on design for the International New York Times. She's spoken at TED and Davos. She sits on the boards and juries of many cultural and design institutions. Of course, she's very well known for having been the director of London's Design Museum. Her recent book, Hello World, Where Design Meets Life, explores the influence of design on our lives, past, present, and future, which has been described as panoramic in scope, passionately argued and highly addictive to read. So please welcome the talented and highly addictive <laughs> Alice Rawsthorne. Well, after that wonderful introduction, I, of course, feel doomed to disappoint. So apologies in advance. And thank you, David and Saskia and Richard and his team for inviting me here. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here at What Design Can Do. And of course, climate change would be a compelling issue for this conference to address at any time. But it's particularly compelling right now. Because for the last few years, dire though the situation on climate change so often feels, we have had not a universal political consensus on the need for change in action, but at least a fairly broad one. But that is changing. We're entering a much more fragile and worrying era. And one of the chief culprits of this, among many other horrors, is this guy. Donald Trump. <laughs> now, months since his election, it is, of course, still deeply weird to think this vision of orangeness is, in fact, the President of the United States and not a sort of hideous figure from a bad soap opera. But during his campaign, Donald Trump not only questioned the validity of climate change, but has threatened to withdraw the US from the Paris Agreement. And he is there's a battle waging on this at the White House now. He's due to make a decision when he returns from the GN summit in Sicily at the end of the week. Now, even if Trump is persuaded not to bring the United States out of the Paris Agreement, without the commitment and leadership of his country and the enthusiasm and genuine passion and conviction that Barack Obama brought to the role, the political efforts to address climate change will be greatly weakened. And this means that the battle will be increasingly dependent on the efforts of individuals, NGOs, and the corporate sector, and they'll need the most powerful tools at their disposal to fight climate change. And for me, those tools would include design. Now, I'm sure everybody in this room would agree with me about that. After all, why else would you be here? But the blunt truth is that most people don't think of design as being equipped to deal with massive issues like climate change at all. They still see it in an old-fashioned, stereotypical sense as a styling, marketing, and promotional tool intended to entice us into buying things we don't really need or want and will eventually discard in a toxic hellhole like this. This is the notorious Agbogloshi dump in Ghana, where many of the unwanted computers and other electronics from Western Europe and North America literally go to fail to die. Now, sadly, some design projects have done exactly what I've just described. They've been guilty as charged, and many still are. But that, of course, is only part of the picture, because design can fulfill much more important and productive roles, too. But its ability to tackle the most complex and important challenges of our time, like climate change, will, of course, be determined to a great degree by whether society thinks it's equipped to do so. And that is the question I want to address now. So I thought it might be helpful to start what design can do about climate change by asking what design can do about it, or what it will be allowed to do about it, ending with a question mark. So I'm going to begin by defining what I think design is, because design is a complex and elusive phenomenon that's meant many different things at different times and in different contexts. But for me, it has always had one elemental role, and that's as an agent of change that can help us to make sense of what's happening and to turn it to our advantage. Because every design exercise sets out to change something. It might make a marginal difference to one person, 
or seek to transform the lives of millions of people, but it embraces change and it does so systematically. And at its best, design can ensure that changes of any type, whether they're scientific, technological, political, economic, cultural, behavioral, or environmental, are interpreted in ways that are positive and empowering, rather than scary, inhibiting, or destructive. And there's absolutely no doubt that we need design now more than ever before to do precisely that, because we're facing scale, sorry, we're facing change on unprecedented scale and at unprecedented speed on so many fronts. And I'm now going to rattle through a deeply depressing list of just some of the very complex problems we face, starting with what Design Can Do's theme of last year, the refugee crisis, in which tens of millions of people are being forced to flee their homes worldwide. There's also the growing imbalance of wealth between rich and poor, the distrust of the political establishment, the rise of the extreme rights, and demagogues who are also climate change doubters. There are ever more terrifying cyber attacks and terrorist attacks like the terrible tragedy in my home city of Manchester last night, accelerating advances in science and technology, and of course, there's climate change. Now, design isn't a panacea for any of these major problems, as The Economist calls them, but I believe it's an incredibly powerful tool to address them intelligently, responsibly, and constructively. But what are the chances of design being allowed and empowered to do that with climate change? Now, I'm going to start with the negatives, the sort of obstacles that I think could prevent design from doing so. And one of the biggest is one I've already alluded to, and it's the trivialization of design. Because it is still popularly perceived as a styling tool and an indulgence for spoilt consumers in developed economies. And if businesses, banks, governments, educationalists and NGOs and everyone else persist in thinking of designers only being useful for producing expensive unstable chairs or blingy cell phone covers, it dooms to being restricted to those roles and to continuing to be overlooked as a possible solution to major problems, climate change change included. And if most people still see design as something that feeds hell holes like this, rather than a tool that can also help to clear them, to clean them up, and ensure that their contents are disposed of responsibly and recycled in future, then why would they think it would? They wouldn't. Now, another obstacle to design is the distrust that has been bred by dodgy design practice. And frankly, the design community and its collaborators have only got themselves to blame for this. Because designers and manufacturers, of course, routinely make bogus claims about sustainability, or they fail to pr make proper provision for repairs, maintenance, and disposing of products responsibly, and they dress up cost-saving initiatives as sort of greenwashing, as if they were environmentally driven. Others don't tell the whole truth, like the hydropower plants that bang on about how much clean renewable energy they're creating, but in an attempt to disguise the environmental damage they cause during construction, or the car makers that boast about how low the carbon emissions of their new vehicles are when they know that even the most gas-guzzling old banger releases most emissions during manufacture than when it's on the road. The most sustainable thing we can do is carry on driving our old cars for as long as possible. And then there are the supposedly environmentally responsible design projects that fail. And here's one of them. The new London bus. Now, this was trumpeted as an environmental marvel, as David will well remember, when it was first introduced by London's former mayor, Boris Johnson. And it's called the Boris Bus, as a tribute to him. But like Boris himself, like its namesake, the bus is a disaster. He is, of course, our foreign minister now, so he's even more powerful, which makes him even more disastrous. Now, I'm in a minority of Londoners because I quite like the way this bus looks. Thomas Heatherwick reinvented the beloved London Routemaster double-decker buses designed in the late 1940s, I think, in a rather engaging way. But the quality of its design engineering is absolutely appalling. The batteries are so flimsy that Boris buses 
run on environmentally damaging diesel because their batteries so often conk out. I can guarantee you that the next time any of you go to London, if you look on the streets, you'll see the corpses of Boris buses broken down there or ones like this being towed away, causing yet more environmental damage. And the ventilation of the early versions was so poor that they were nicknamed the Roast Masters because literally the poor passengers roasted inside them. Now we have a much more sensible mayor, Sadiq Khan, and of course the dreaded Boris bus is being scrapped. So people like me will talk about it as a cautionary tale in environmental design for decades to come. But the problem is that comical though they can sound, every false and flaky claim about sustainable design reminds people of the stereotypes of design and drains their confidence in it. It reinforces the notion that design is a contributor, even a catalyst for climate change, not a possible solution. And the third and final obstacle I'm going to talk about is civil warfare. This is the conflict within the design and indeed the environmental communities. Whenever I go to debates on climate change, I'm often, not always, but often staggered by the hostility between different factions in the debate. And the design communities we all know can be equally divisive. Now we can only hope that what design can do doesn't follow the precedent set by perhaps one of the most famous design conferences on environmentalism. This was the 1970 Aspen Design Conference, gathering under this ant farm pavilion. And it ended with such a fierce attack on the British design critic Rainer Bannum by the French sociologist Jean Baudrillard that it haunted the design debate on environmentalism for many years. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment that we shouldn't be critical of shoddy design practice. That would be a disaster. On the contrary, far greater rigor is needed if design is going to win the public's confidence and political support and fulfill its true potential. But it has to be constructive criticism, and it shouldn't trigger the sort of self-destructive squabbling that has haunted the women's movement for so long, until recently. So over with the gloomy stuff, having given you three negatives that I feel are serious impediments to design being accepted as a possible tool to tackle climate change, I'm now going to talk about the more cheerful side of things, the positives that make me feel more optimistic. And one is a radical shift in design, the new spirit in de of design practice that fulfills a prophecy made by one of my personal design heroes, Laszlo Moulinage, in Chicago in 1947, which was this, design is not a profession, but an attitude. And I believe a new generation of independent, politically driven, attitudinal designers are emerging who are already making a huge difference to design's ability to tackle these complex problems. Now, the chief catalyst is digital technology, because thanks to fairly basic digital tools, designers can now operate independently, free from commercial constraints, should they wish to, by pursuing their own objectives, whether they're social, political, environmental or commercial. They can raise money from crowdfunding, they can manage huge quantities of complex data on affordable computers, they can organize production from crowd manufacturing, they can flush out collaborators on social media and raise awareness of their projects on them, and they can sell and disseminate their work online. And all of this has enabled a new generation of attitudinal designers, many of them here in the Netherlands, to work independently on incredibly ambitious endeavors, including including climate change. But unfortunately, one of the most visible and prominent and mediagenic of such projects has aroused the sort of hostility that I described earlier as an impediment, and that is this. It's the Ocean Cleanup Array, which of course was conceived by the young Dutch design engineer Boyan Stadt to devise a safe, efficient, and relatively inexpensive way of tackling one of the biggest pollution problems of our time, clearing toxic plastic trash from the oceans. Now, 
There has been fierce criticism of the ocean cleanup array of Boyan Slat and his team and their plans from every side, environmentalists, designers, and scientists. They all have different arguments against it. Yet despite this, they have recently announced, last week in fact, that they've raised $30 million from crowdfunding, Dutch government grants, and a swathe of private donors. They have developed and tested the concept in the North Sea, and they're planning to start extracting plastic trash from the Pacific next year. Now, whatever you think of it, the ocean cleanup's success in generating all that capital and public excitement demonstrates the potential for other entrepreneurial, attitudinal design projects with lofty ambitions and admirable goals. And if it succeeds, despite the criticism, and I have no idea whether it will or not, because I haven't investigated it and lack the scientific ability to do so rigorously enough, but if it succeeds, it's going to be a whole lot easier for similar projects to raise funding and mobilize political and public support in future. And if it fails, it'll be a whole lot harder for them. Now, another big positive, I think, oddly, is corporate self-interest. Now, large-scale corporates in particular, but in fact many companies, have unexpectedly powerful incentives to invest in the sort of sustainable measures that are needed to help combat climate change. Because in blunt corporate, commercial, and capitalistic terms, many of them have significant and critically immediately measurable cost benefits. Number one, any company that uses less energy, fuel, water stands to save substantial sums of money as well as reducing its carbon footprint, so a direct benefit to the bottom line. Number two, an increasing percentage of investment funds on the New York and London stock markets are so-called ethical investment funds. Now, the definition of ethical can be very broad, but in most cases, it means that these funds don't invest in companies that don't meet specific targets, and an increasing number of them include sustainability among those targets. So any company that wants to attract their investment has to comply with certain environmental goals. And number three, most major companies are in fierce competition to attract the brightest and best graduates because they want the best possible leadership for the future. And all the research shows that top graduates tend to favor ethically and environmentally responsible companies for the obvious reason they want to feel proud of the people they work for. Now, that's a lot of very powerful, pragmatic reasons to convince corporates that it's in their self-interest to try and step up in terms of trying to combat climate change, and some, though sadly only some, are trying to do so. But the final reason why I believe there are grounds for optimism is that slowly but surely, we're establishing an incredible array of success stories in different places, different sectors, with different objectives and on different scales. Now, some of them are ingenious and inspiring attitudinal design projects that are relatively small, but making a big impact, often by their smart use of digital tools. One of my favorites is this one. It's We Cyclers. Now, this is a project in Lagos, Nigeria, and it is a system that designed cargo bicycles to collect recyclable trash from the Lagos slums, where the streets are so narrow and so congested that the city refuse trucks couldn't access them. Um, householders text. We cyclers, when they want their recyclables to be collected, Nigeria, like many African countries, has more people who have regular cell phone access than access to clean running water. So most of the people in those areas will have a cell phone. They text for the recyclables to be collected, and they can trade them in exchange for vouchers for food, cleaning products, and cell phone minutes. And We Cyclers then takes the recyclables away to be disposed of responsibly. Now, one of my favorite corporate design success stories in this area is handily my current favorite sneakers. They've been my favorites for a couple of years now, and they are Nike Flyknits. Now, one of the reasons I like them is they feel like slippers. Uh, they're so comfortable. Another is that they have this sort of pixelated surface, so they strike me as this really weird, sort of freaky, very now, sort of analog but digital 
product, but also they're fantastically sustainable. They're made from recycled and recyclable polyester yarn. Because Nike developed a special digital knitting technology to produce them, it can estimate exactly how much yarn it's going to need, so there's no waste. The next move will be to 3D print the soles, and then they'll be even more sustainable. The first fly knits were introduced in 2012, and they already account for just under 10% of Nike's sneaker sales. So they are a huge mass market product already. But one of the biggest contributors to the battle against climate change is, of course, clean energy and projects like these. The wind farms that are being built in windy countries like mine, Britain, and yours, the Netherlands, and the solar power projects that are built in sunnier ones. This is part of the colossal Noor solar power plant in Morocco. It's on the part of the Sahara Desert that fellow Game of Thrones fans may recognize as a site where Daenerys Targaryen marauded with her dragons and Dothraki warriors, now covered by these mirrors. Now, for a country like Morocco, this could have huge economic and social benefits, as well as environmental benefits. And Every area of clean renewable energy, wind power, solar power, water power, is producing much, much more energy now than was forecast 10, 15, 20 years ago. In some cases, up to 70 times more for solar power. They're way ahead of all the targets, so that means that fossil fuel consumption is starting to fall in some countries. Only a fortnight ago, the Indian government announced that the price of solar energy in India had fallen below that of coal-generated energy for the first time ever. Now, India is currently the world's third biggest carbon polluter, so as that trend continues, it should have a very powerful effect. So that's why I believe that design has such an important part to play in climate change, because undoubtedly it was absolutely pivotal in helping to make those clean energy generators more efficient, less expensive, and more durable. And it will continue to ring huge benefits in years to come. And that's also why I believe that despite all of the obstacles, public and political perceptions of design will change and will be corrected, and that design will be empowered to help us not only to fight climate change, but to support us in many other critically important areas of our lives in future. Thank you. Alice, you talk to us about the trivialization of the word design then, and do you think we need a new way to reclaim the name, the word design, or, or do we need new language around it, and what do you think of things like the word design thinking? Does that, has that helped in that conversation? Um, it has certainly helped in that conversation, and definitely the latter. I mean, I think that it's a sign of extreme weakness to abandon a yeah. name. Every museum board I've ever been on, everyone talks about dumping the M word. Yeah. Um, and I think that design is a word we should be proud of. I mean, look at its achievements, his past, present, and we hope future. But undoubtedly, the discourse around design has to change. And, you know, that is the responsibility of people like me. I have the privilege of not solely, obviously, there are many, many <laughs> people who bear the burden. <laughs> no, but it's certainly partly the fault of people yeah. like like me, that we still need an improvement because there's a huge battle to change public perceptions of design. Now, if they hadn't done it, I was going to ask them. So, Climate uh, Council. And yes. I'm scared of you already. Oh, no. <laughs> Don't be. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much. Um, very interesting. A uh, question I have is, um, do you think that the general public, like a lot of people, they don't really know anything about all these examples that you uh, mention, and they just see the depressing headlines and they resort to either denialism or cynicism. Um, for example, part of the voters uh, of Trump. Um, what do you think design can do to engage those people? 
Well, I think it's got to carry on doing what it's doing already, because um, in this area, climate change, and so many other of the big social, the big complex major problems I talked about, we now have a huge body of case studies that really do work, that are making a difference, whether it's on a very small scale or a huge national or global scale. So I think designers have got to continue to become even more innovative, even more ingenious, even more inspiring, and to shout about it. I think that public perceptions of an understanding of design have become increasingly sophisticated over the years, never sophisticated enough. It's a huge mm -hmm. battle, but I really think we have made progress over the years, and I'm absolutely confident that we'll continue to do so in the future. Ta -da. Ta -da. I want the buzzer. <laughs> DJ, give me the Come buzzer. On, you've already got that thing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, you blamed Trump, Shell, for so much. society, yeah. <laughs> the Boris buses, but um, I was a bit surprised you didn't mention us, human beings, and our behavior. So, what can design do for our? behavior and contribute to behavioral change because there it all starts, I think, I believe. It, um, it absolutely does, but I think some of the projects I talked about do precisely that. If you look at the impact of We Cyclers in Lagos, it's changing behavior, people's attitudes, the, the way they look at their possessions, their objects, the way they think of their responsibility and society's responsibility to dealing with those objects once they no longer find them useful or no longer have room for them in their lives. I think that design affects our behavior in all sorts of ways. You don't necessarily need to have a behaviorally driven or oriented design project to do so. Um, I, I like the example, and in fact there are a lot of examples that are, uh, have influence uh, locally, but um, shouldn't we raise the bar and see if we can do more on a bigger scale, because um, I don't think it's enough. I agree, but I think one of the problems in terms of public attitudes and environmentalism in general is that a lot of the initiatives look very small when they start, and people think, duh, it's not enough. So in Britain, for example, where we were much slower than the Dutch and the Germans, for example, to embrace recycling, people were very slow to start recycling in a responsible and proper way because they really felt that that little gesture just for their home wouldn't make a difference. Collectively, it's not perfect. It needs to get a whole lot better, but it really has made a difference. The British are so mean as a nation. I can obviously say this being British. No one else can, <laughs> apart from David, maybe. Yeah, I, I'll agree. <laughs> Keep um, nodding. That when the gov it was only when the government imposed a charge on plastic carrier bags from supermarkets and other yeah. food stores. The use of them absolutely collapsed. I think it's same, something like 7% of yeah. what it was. So I think little things like that that seemed yeah. almost meaningless initially, they're not going to make a massive difference in themselves, but collectively they do. Yeah. Now, ladies, well, I'm afraid Climate Council <laughs> next time round. <laughs> but we're going to have Ooh. to move on because we've got a whole programme ahead of us. Ladies and gentlemen, to the Climate Council, but especially Alice, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.